This podcast represents the opinions of our hosts and their guests only. The content here should not be taken as medical advice and is for informational purposes only. And because each person is so unique, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions. Welcome to Once Shattered, Picking Up the Pieces, a podcast devoted to changing the way eating disorders and mental illness are viewed in our society. With your hosts, Jack and Linda Major and Ellen Bennett. Today's guest is Sherry Botwin, licensed clinical social worker. Sherry has been counseling survivors of eating disorders, trauma, and abuse in her South Jersey private practice for over 27 years. Her second book, Thriving After Trauma, Stories of Living and Healing, was released in an updated paperback in October 2021. Botwin is working on her third book, Stolen Childhoods, which focuses on reclaiming life in adulthood after surviving childhood abuse. Botwin has presented CE workshops for IAEDP, Renfrew, and Stockton State College. She has appeared on numerous international media platforms, including Good Morning America, NBC Nightly, MSNBC, CBS Today, The New York Times, Time Magazine, The Associated Press, Sports Illustrated, and Radio Europe. In July 2022, Botwin presented a webinar for over 1,000 attendees at the Trauma and Recovery Center in China on the role of an eating disorder in staying stuck in abuse. On September 22nd, 2023, Botwin will be running an all-day CE training for Stockton State College on managing countertransference when working with survivors of eating disorders and abuse. Botwin has also served as an expert witness in high-profile cases involving sexual assault and childhood abuse. Find out more about Sherry on her website, sherrybotwin.com. Welcome, everyone. It's great to be with you again. This podcast is brought to you by The Emily Connection and KMB for Answers. Today, we are very excited for you to meet our guest, and she'll be with us momentarily. But first, I'd like to welcome the guy sitting next to me, my husband and soulmate, Jack Major, and our dear friend and fellow advocate, Alan Bennett. Yeah, I'm still here. She can't get rid of me, so. Um. <laughs> You're a keeper. Yeah. Welcome, listeners. Oh, God, Jack, we need you. You're, you. You make us haul. Welcome, everyone. And remember, the links for us and for our show today with Sherry are in the show notes. Thanks so much. Welcome back. Uh, to set the stage today, I'd like to read a quote. And it is by Bessel van der Kolk. And he is, he is an author himself and a psychologist. And he wrote the book, The Body Keeps Score. And the quote is, being able to, to feel safe with other people is probably the single most important aspect of mental health and safe connections are fundament, fundamental for meaningful and satisfying lives. What do you both think about this quote? Um. <clears throat> Safe space, yeah. I mean, just offering a safe space for people to to feel no judgment, um, to feel um, a connection with with people, and uh, it's it's just so important because we we live in a society that, that judges people, and um, that that has to stop. So if you just offer a safe space for somebody that you that you know is hurting or you think it is hurting in any way, please just offer them that space, reach out to them. It's so real and so true. And it opens that space for us to be ourselves and be who we are and be comfortable and true to ourselves. So it's so critically important. And now I'd like to welcome our special guest who happens to be nationally and internationally known because of her passion, her books, and her specialty, specialty, which is counseling people who have experienced some form of trauma. And Sherry has experienced trauma herself, so she has lived experience. Welcome, Sherry. We're so happy you can join us today. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome, Sherry. I've read and heard so much about you, so it's, it's great to have you here today. Wonderful to have the opportunity for you to be with us. So, Sherry... I'm going to jump right in here. There are so many different types of trauma people experience. Jack and I listened to the audible version of Thriving After Trauma. 
It is beautifully written, honest, and so important. And at the same time, it is so difficult to imagine what some people and some children have had to endure. Yet the vignettes in your book are hopeful in that people can find strength to do the work can find the strength to do the work and open up with the guidance of a therapist who understands trauma. That sh- they show us that it is very possible for people to thrive or thrive once again. Can you tell us about your new book coming out and where listeners can find you? Sure. So my I'm, I just started working on my new book called Stolen Childhoods. This book is going to be specifically for child adult survivors of different types of childhood abuse. The reason I decided I wanted to write this book is because in Thriving After Trauma, I was able to talk about many different aspects of trauma, different types of experiences. But my real passion and my my heart and soul is really for survivors, adult survivors of childhood abuse, because it's something that I've had to work through, acknowledge, grapple with. Um, since I was a very young girl. So I'm very excited about it. If people want to find me, they can find me on, on all different types of social media, Warrior Botwin 7 on Instagram. I'm on Facebook and I have a website, which is my name, www.sherrybotwin.com. Sherry, thank you. Um, You are so compassionate about trauma, and you can hear it in everything you say and as you read your, your book. And you also weave in the importance of healing. How do you know when it is time to ask for help to deal with your trauma? Are there emotions, behaviors, or other things that tell us? Sometimes I I think we don't even realize that what we have experienced has traumatized us, whether it is one event or a series of experiences. Can you share a little more about that with us? And I love that you're asking that question and what you're saying, because it is very true. Many people, when they're growing up and they're in their early adulthoods, have been through different types of experiences and have no idea what to call it, where it comes from, what it means to them. The the way I figured this out started really with my own story. When I was in my very early adulthood, I was struggling with eating disorder tendencies, I felt so depressed, disconnected, was considering suicide. And at that time, I kept asking myself, what is wrong? Why am I like this? Why do you feel this way? And I didn't realize at the time that I was burying years of incest and memories around my abuse. And that as I was getting to be an independent young woman, those those memories and feelings started to break through. So if you're out there and you're feeling like my life isn't my own, or if you feel like I can't function in relationships, or if you're somebody that is in the throes of an eating disorder and it's consuming you, but you don't understand why that is, these are all reasons why people will come to therapy. Often when I'm meeting people for the first time, or even in the first year, They say that they're coming to me because maybe they have an eating disorder or they'll report depression or even report that they have PTSD, but they won't actually know what the PTSD stems from, what the trauma was or is, because most of us, when we've been through experiences where we've been hurt by family members or when something happens during our childhood, our brains don't allow us to know what happened to us until we become independent adults living our own lives. And that's really the time when people will start to realize that they need help. And that's when the healing really can start to begin. Okay. So, and you, you deal with all kinds of trauma, right? You have people with, with all, all kinds of trauma. Um, And one of the, again, trauma is very, um, widespread in our society and um, divorce is from what I can understand is a 50 50 you know over 50 percent divorce rate 
youth in this country. And that can be very traumatic on, on children. So what advice would you give parents who are going through a divorce or who have been divorced uh, recently to help the younger children and teenage children navigate through these transitions? And maybe even, you know, adult children, not, not just, you know, younger children. I think the most important thing for parents is to try and keep whatever's going on in their divorce or in their separation out of the relationship with their children, with their children. They need to reassure them that we're not divorcing you, we're divorcing each other. They need to try and create a sense of stability for children and really, really remind them that the divorce is not something that they caused. Divorce is something that ha that happens between the partners and you as the children, you are not at fault. You are not responsible. You are not the cause of this. On a, I mean, on a personal note, I mean, my parents didn't get divorced. They were, they were married their whole life. But I remember um, some of the arguments that they had that were very volatile. And I can remember my father and mother coming in and telling me that this had nothing to do with me. You know, they both love me and um, which was reassuring. You know, I think I was a teenager at that point. Sherry, I'm very sorry for what you have been through and what so many people have experienced as children. You know, when things happen to children, it's just so awful and so unfair, um, but it's very important for people to be able to share their stories and their journeys. And and I think you have opened up um, a very important door for it to become more, oh, well, what is the word, that it's easier for people to talk about it when somebody has taken the first step like you have in such a big way. So I thank you for that. I also wanted to speak to um, mental health and COVID, especially since... COVID, our children um, are more uh, vulnerable to a lot of things because of the isolation that it brought upon us. So uh, bullying has become even more of a problem because of social media. Often parents are the last to know what is happening at school, on the bus, or through social media. These events can be precursors to very serious mental health issues. Do you have some thoughts on how parents can get their children to open up? And when do you believe therapy is warranted? So I have a just about gonna turn 12 year old little guy. So I'm sort of in the height of some of this. We're now in the middle school years. And what I have seen this year and what I have learned about the impact of social media, the bullying that takes place in these schools, the lack of understanding and insight among the teaching profession, parents, students, it's overwhelming. And I think that with COVID and being now so much more attached to our phones, what we need to do as parents is we need to keep the door open so that when or if our kids are dealing with something like bullying, they feel like they can come to us. Oftentimes, children are very embarrassed when they're being bullied and they don't want to tell their parents because they think that their parents are going to be mad or they think their parents aren't going to believe them. There's a lot of reasons. And again, kids can be very protective of their peers as well. So I think fostering an environment where your child knows that even if he's the one doing the bullying, that he can come to you and talk about what it is that's going on in his life that's causing him to act in such mean ways. If you, if you think about it again, we've all been in middle school. We were teenagers. There are differences in the world now, but there are also many things that are very much the same. So one of the things I like to do as a parent is I'll sit down with my little man and talk with him. And again, I don't, I don't go into detail, but if I, if he starts talking in a way that I think is offensive or disrespectful, I'll share with him, listen, dude, there's things that I went through when I was in, in middle school. And I just want to explain to you what can happen if you if you talk like that to girls or if you treat people like that. And I think that that's really important because I think it helps kids to know how to navigate, especially when they feel like they have to join the group, they want to fit in. 
there's a part of them that knows that what's going on isn't okay, but they don't know how to handle that. So I think having ongoing conversations and educating and parents to be able to use our own experiences, again, in a way that's appropriate and, and in a way that a 12 year old or 15 year old or however old kid can understand, that's really what fosters, I think, safety and connection and will help to prevent some of the stuff that we're seeing in school and on social media. Yeah. Those, you know, the, the old days of <clears throat> having the family dinner at five o'clock, you know, is, is, is still around, but it's uh, not as much as it used to be. I mean, kids, you know, they, they get on a bus at seven thirty in the morning, they go to school, they're there, they have extracurricular activities after school, you know, if they're in sports, they get on a bus and they go, you know, play a game somewhere away and then get back on the bus and they're home at uh, maybe 8.30 at night, you know. So um, there's just the, that uh, 11 hour, 12, sometimes 12 hours of being away from home. And then when they do get home, they're tired and parents are tired. So there's no communication. And, and so, you know, some of this stuff is, is just stifled and, and, and buried for these kids. Yeah. So it's just so important for the parents to say, hey, how, how, what happened today? How did things go? You know? I also remember some, some of the most significant conversations happening in the car, driving mm-hmm. the kids from one place to another. Mm-hmm. And there's certain times when they're just ready to talk and it might not be at the dinner table or when you're going for a walk. You know, it can just be any time. So you just have to take advantage and tap into that space. So very true. As a former educator, you know, bullying's been around forever and ever and ever. And I think for far too long, we just accepted it as, uh, you know, it's a part of growing up. We need to. um, And now we've had it's increased exponentially from multiple directions. And it really is that we're at a critical issue. And I love your You know, saying that parents open up and talk to your kids and have that conversation on a consistent and regular basis and help them move through it in a healthy way, whether they're being bullied or um, they're the one kind of causing some pain there. Okay, my question is, I was listening to your talk on your book, Thriving After Trauma, Stories of Living and Healing. You mentioned the emotions connected with trauma, shame, guilt, trust, intimacy, connection. And I could not help but connect the same emotions with eating disorders. They are the same. And it seems the impact of an eating disorder is in itself trauma. Do you have any thoughts on this? I mean, again, it's a great question. And it's probably a question that could take me all day to answer. <laughs> One of the main... <laughs> but you've <laughs> got to get back and to if court. You, <laughs> if, you, if you ask some of my clients, they say, you talk an awful lot for a therapist. Well, listen, I have a lot to say. Um, <laughs> I've learned a lot, but I think, again... What I've come to understand is that an eating disorder is so much like what people feel when they go through trauma because of the element of secrecy, the shame, the distrust, the inability to really listen to our intuitions. And one of the biggest things that stands out for me is people who've been sexually assaulted or victim or survivors of childhood abuse, we struggle a lot with feelings of shame, feeling at fault, feeling like we should have been able to do something different. So we are not experts when it comes to self-care and self-compassion. So what ends up happening, and I see this a lot in my work, is that many of us develop these eating disorders because we can't deal with some of these feelings associated with our trauma, but what we don't realize is we're what we're doing with our eating disorder is we're, we're re-traumatizing ourselves because we're re-experiencing the same feelings. When I struggled with anorexia, this, I was doing the same thing that I was doing with the incest. I was trying to keep it a secret from myself. I was in denial about what I was doing to my body, how it was affecting me. I was so afraid to tell people 
that I was struggling with an eating disorder because I thought people weren't going to believe me. And these are all the same things that happen and continue to happen to me and many of my clients when we talk about what our parents did to us or what our partners or whoever abused us. It's the same thing. So really, well, the reason I wrote the book um, and the reason I do this work is because I feel like if we can if we can learn and understand the meaning and the role of our eating disorder, we can understand how 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 and where it comes from. We then as adults get to 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 decide, OK, do I want to continue to have an eating disorder to serve as my protector, as my best friend, as my outlet for my rage? Or do I want to replace some of that self-destructive self-hating, self-loathing tendencies with trusting, meaningful connections. That's very well said. So talking about emotions, um, sadness, anxiety, grief, powerlessness, shame, they're also deeply felt and powerful emotions. And we deal with each of these emotions throughout our lives at different times. Some people are very good at masking these feelings and are not open to talk about something traumatic that happened to them. We are huge supporters of therapy and counseling, but sometimes it's hard to get people to make an appointment. Teletherapy seems easier for some to embrace. How do you feel about teletherapy? Do you offer it? And uh, also, you might want to tell people about your podcast. How do I feel about teletherapy? Okay, this is going to probably be an interesting answer. When I'm a patient and I'm seeing my therapist, who I've known for 20 something years, I don't like teletherapy. So as a patient, I feel like I need to be sitting in the room with my therapist because there's so much that she has communicated to me through her body language and just through her presence. The idea of being in that safe space for me, as I'm uncovering memories of incest was very important. As a therapist, what I can tell you is that there are people who are now opening up sooner about their traumas, I believe, because we are on a video. What ends up happening for some clients is that, and again, if you could see where some of these sessions have taken place, the backseat of a car, a bathroom, a closet. I mean, I've had therapy sessions everywhere. And what I notice is that people are actually very good at finding safe spaces to do their sessions. So what happens is, for instance, a lot of people have their dogs and cats now with them during therapy. Well, I brought my dog to therapy because my therapist was the bomb. And she was like, just bring your dog because she was, <laughs> Chloe was like my, she was my tool to get from one place to the other. And she was this little 15 pound King Charlie. She was a little light bulb. So I had Chloe with me now again, like with teletherapy, people's dogs and cats, and even sometimes people's partners, family members end up sort of showing up in the session. And I think that what it ends up doing is it provides an element of safety that maybe people don't have when they're in an office. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely brought more people out uh, to ask for help. Um, yeah. Um, I just wanted to go back for a second and talk about how trauma is, is so personal and that one person's trauma can't be compared to another person's trauma. Um, people do this very frequently, and um, I, I believe that our capacity to handle a stressful or dangerous situation depends on so many things and and uh, what may not be a major stressor for one person can rock somebody else to their core. So as a society and as a friend, how can we be more compassionate to, to, not, to not do that, say, you know, to judge somebody's trauma versus somebody else's and say, oh, that's nothing, you know? So. I mean, I think in a way you just said it. I think as people, if we remember that everybody's experience is unique to their own lives, to sit in a place of openness and compassion versus having questions or wanting to fix it or wanting to dismiss it, 
I, again, the most important thing for people with trauma is that they feel like they have a witness, that they feel like somebody hears them. They feel like somebody can, somebody believes them and somebody can acknowledge and validate their feelings, even if they don't fully understand what it is that happened. I, I just listened to Vessel van der Kolk speak the other night, and that was one of the things that he spoke about. Survivors don't need for, for justice to occur. We don't need to necessarily be in a courtroom to have a judge or a jury find the defendant guilty. We need to have people in our lives that say, I, I mm -hmm. hear you. I believe you. I can't even imagine what that was like for you to be able to be acknowledged for our resiliency and our ability to stay alive and stay on earth and create lives that are full of purpose and meaning. That's important to be able to acknowledge that trauma survivors do not need people to fix it. And we don't need people to tell us it's going to be OK or I'm so sorry that that happened to you. We don't need that. We need people to say, I hear you. Mm -hmm. I wish that didn't happen to you. I don't know how you made it through that. I don't know how you're still standing here today. That's what I mean. And again, I can't speak for everybody, but I can tell you in all the years that I've done this work, that's ultimately what brings about healing. And that's ultimately what helps us re realize, oh, okay. So there are not all people are bad. Mm -hmm. There are people out in this world that will care about me, that won't judge me and that will accept me for who I am no matter what. Mm. That's wonderful. Wow. Validation and feeling safe. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is a great conversation. As we continue talking about trauma, which has become much more and more an open topic, um, and it, it's important and it's really positive and it's going to help us do the work that all of us need to do and support each other and help each other. Um, it's led us to talk about trauma-informed care, trauma-informed teaching, all of those things that saying, hey, we have to acknowledge and recognize that each of us is coming from a different point. Point. I believe it is important for all of us to have a baseline understanding of how trauma can impact our daily lives. As we encourage the conversation about mental health, we should do the same for trauma so that we create communities that are supportive, understanding, and compassionate. How do we as individuals and families and communities embrace this understanding? Help us know what steps we can take to begin to help others heal and ourselves. I think, again, the steps that we want to take are to, like you said, inform the public about the aftermath of trauma and what is required for somebody to find a full life or reclaim their lives after trauma and to understand that you cannot be cured of PTSD. You can learn to live with it. You can learn to manage it. You can go years without having PTSD symptoms. But once something happens to us, at any point, we can be triggered, even again, if it's not for years. So to recognize as a community that there needs to be supports and education so that people understand what it is to be in the life or in the body of someone who's a survivor and to welcome people with open arms and to say, there's no such thing as saying it too many times. You need to continue to speak your story. You need to continue to find different outlets or different ways. And again, that's the core of my life. If I didn't do this for a job, if I didn't become a, a single, um, how do you say the single by choice parent? Mm -hmm. If I didn't create the life that I'm living, I don't think I would be here. And if I were here, I wouldn't be sitting here on this show. I would probably be in my 10th or 11th or 15th inpatient stay because mm -hmm. that's what it's like when you're living in the aftermath of trauma. You have... I have to be on top of myself and on, on top of 
all the different things that are going on in my life and the triggers. And that's something that I help clients with too. So as a community to recognize these types of issues come and go, any life change can bring on PTSD, good or bad. And there's no such thing as you should be able to get over that. Why haven't you moved past that? We don't get over trauma. We learn to live with it. We don't get past it. We learn to integrate it into our lives so that we can live with it. That's what recovery is. And that's what recovery from an eating disorder is too, I think. Yeah. I was just going to ask you about that, you know, about, cause um, everybody's recovery uh, story is, is different from an eating disorder. And, uh, and um, people think you just have, uh, there was a, a woman we had on a podcast. I think it was our first season and, from England, and she said, "You know, people think uh, my recovery story is running through, you know, fields and eating ice cream. Well, that's that's not the case. You know, everything isn't this perfect life that that follows uh, eating disorder recovery or, or any recovery. So, uh, it's very important that people um, understand that. And and Linda recently, um, on one of her training sessions, said that uh, people." You know, it's not a straight line in recovery, and people don't go backwards. They just take a step sideways. Is that what? That was that was from Lindsay in one of our groups. Actually, said that because oh. um, people always tell you fell back or it was a step backwards, and she said, "No, no, that's not the way I like to look at it. You didn't lose everything that you gained. You just took a side step." And I thought that was a beautiful yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm still. Um, working part-time as a pharmacist coming to the end of my pharmacy career. And uh, so I still have to call doctor's offices and, you know, hit one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven on their, you know, thing to, to be put on hold. And, and I had this message recently now with one of the health systems here in, in Rochester that, um, and they talk about cancer being, the diagnosis of being very traumatic, uh, emotionally, financially, and, et cetera. And there's other, uh, disease states now that they use too, but, and then it, it goes on to say, you know, we treat the whole person, mind and body. So, um, do you think the comprehensive levels of care, uh, are happening more frequently since COVID for your patients with mental health issues? And, um, how do we get all the insurance companies on board to pay attention and provide better coverage for people struggling with mental health issues, uh, before, before they're so ingrained in them that they can no longer function or worse, that they may die. Um, there's a place for medication, you know, I've seen it through my years, but the idea of a pill for every ill isn't working so well, uh, especially, especially with mental illness. So what are your thoughts? And we could probably talk for the rest of the day on this. Yeah, I was gonna say, do you have a 50,000 hours? <laughs> <laughs> because again, part of like, the whole healing process that involves the mind, the body, the spirit. And I think that we tend to get so focused on the specific issue that we forget that there's a whole person sitting in the room with us. So with mental illness, and I see this a lot with trauma, there's a lot of psychosomatic issues that follow trauma. People develop all kinds of illnesses, chronic pain. So I think being able to add some more integrative alternative therapies into the course of healing and for insurance companies to recognize the importance of that. People who just go to therapy once a week, that's that's not enough. It, you know, again, I work with some clients who are very resourceful and they will find alternative healing, even if it's something like going to yoga, meditating, journaling, singing. I have a friend who talks to trees when she's upset. <laughs> so, I mean, again, that doesn't cost her any money. And she says that's what really gets her through from day to day. So I think it's important that we talk more openly. And again, starting with our children about different outlets and different ways to take care of our whole body. There are times when I talk with trauma survivors and I say things like, what can we do to help you to heal your heart? How do we, how can we wrap our arms around that part of you that is so in so much pain? And how can we do that so that you don't keep restricting so you don't have to feel? So I think being able 
to find doctors because there are doctors out here who are more trauma informed and understanding. There are OB offices now that will offer chaperones for visits. So there's different things that have been happening, which we're taking steps in the right direction. But in terms of the insurance companies, we probably should we should all be calling them and Mm -hmm. saying we need to put this in as part of the coverage and we need to put this in as part of the coverage. People with eating disorders get discharged from these centers and they have so limited amount of what they need to actually stay out of the hospital. There's so many there's so many uh, supports that need to be set in place that often aren't when somebody's discharged and that sets them up to relapse. Yeah, I mean, insurance companies don't cover a dietitian, uh, you know, for somebody yeah. with an eating disorder. <laughs> I mean, it, it's just and and it's just unconscionable, you know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Ellen knows that uh, the insurance is uh, <laughs> my my thing to uh, start uh, going after. Um, it's okay. We need to get after them. There's just so many families out there. So many families that have lost children unnecessarily, or are just going through so many frustrations with with their their kids or adults. You know, they're just floating in the wind out there, and the insurance companies um, just aren't giving them the the treatment. And so many people that could get back and be a, a you know positive. Uh, functioning person in society and, and not be on, you know, assistance. And because th- th- nobody wants to be on assistance. They, they want to get their lives back. They had a life before um, the eating disorder took over and they want that life back. And so, and so anyway. So we are uh, that part of the Emily Connection. Okay. So that's our nonprofit. And we're huge proponents of peer support. So we run uh, a few groups for adults with eating disorders, and then we run another group for um, parents and loved ones of someone with an eating disorder, family members. Uh, And it's wonderful just to see the connection among the people in the groups. It's, It's cathartic for me to see that. And those groups are the things that we wish were here for Emily and for us. Do you do peer support? For Does it work as well for trauma or is that something that works better one-on-one with a therapist solely? I'm just curious. Yeah, so before COVID and before I became a single parent, I actually ran groups for years in my practice. I, I called them women's therapy groups. They were comprised of uh, women who both had eating disorders and trauma histories. And like you just were saying, there's nothing more powerful than sitting in a room with somebody else and being able to share your experience and to be able to feel understood just by sitting down in the room with somebody. I it, And I think at some point I'll be doing more of this when, when my little guy gets older, but I think the peer support is actually the most important piece. The peer support that I formed for myself when I went through trauma therapy was what kept me here. My therapist is amazing and wonderful, but she couldn't do all of what I needed. She's just one person. So when I talk to trauma survivors or people with eating disorders, one of the first things I do is say, how can we set up the army of support for you so that you can go through this without ever feeling like you're by yourself? If you only have a therapist or if you only have a dietitian, that's not enough. You can't just rely on your partner. You can't just rely on your best friend. The more the merrier. Uh, And I think that that is, even as clinicians, that was something else that Bessel talked about the other night. How do therapists not get burned out and not sort of become numb and callous to this work? It's by sitting and talking with other people. That's how we do it. If we just see people all day long and we don't talk to our colleagues about what's going on in the office... It's just it's going to be too much for us to hold. If you're struggling with an eating disorder and you're holding a lot of feelings of anger and shame and resentment, if you're only talking to your therapist once a week, that's too much for you to hold. You need to be figuring out different outlets every single day. And obviously, people, there's nothing more powerful than having a witness, somebody to sit with you, even if it's just somebody that says, Let's just go sit and hang out. Let me let me do a FaceTime with you and have dinner with you. Even if even if you don't want to talk about 
whatever annoying thing your therapist said in the session. It, it's just the idea of having people around us and knowing that we're held and supported. That just is so important. Mm. And I think we asked you before, and we kind of skipped over it, but you have your own podcast with a friend of yours who is a judge. You want to tell our viewers about that? I sure do. And again, sadly, the podcast is about to wrap up because I'm in the middle of writing another book. So when when this show airs, we may have wrapped up, but it's called Warrior Women Speak. So I'm I'm co-hosting with Judge Rosemary Aquilina. She's the judge that sent Dr. Larry Nasser, who abused over 150 gymnasts, to prison for life. So we've been doing the podcast on and off for about three years, and we talk about issues related to trauma, all types of issues. We talk about eating disorders. We talk about bullying and raising kids in 2023. So we pretty much have covered any topic or every topic that maybe other people are not really wanting to talk about. Thank you. I've listened to it. It's excellent. When we're running out of time here, but I want to thank you so much for joining us today. You're brave and you're dedicated and you care so much about your clients and children. And it's just heartwarming. And I, I look forward to meeting you someday. I'm, I'm ho- I hope our cross our paths will our paths will cross so um thank you so so much and we also need to remind our listeners that all the links for today's show are in the show notes we cannot go without thanking rock Vox recording and production and sound engineer and dear friend scott fitzgerald for expertly producing our podcast and so much more sherry thank you so much and we ask our listeners to help us continue the conversations. Please rate, review, share, and subscribe to Once Shattered on the podcast platform that you are listening to. Thank you so much. Sherry, thank you. This has been wonderful. I'm sure we could go on for hours um, talking about different things. Yeah. Uh-huh. So. Yes. I just want to say, can I just, I'm raising my hand yes. if anybody can't see me out there, but I would like to say to both of you that what you've done with your loss and with your trauma um, is so inspiring. And I have known about both of you for several years. So to be able to sit sort of in the room, even though it's via Zoom, um, and to hear about what you've done to help other parents and other survivors, it's remarkable. So the world is very lucky to have you. And I um, think that we have a lot in common when it comes to how we deal with our traumas and how we're using our life experiences to help others as a way to stay sane and to stay hopeful. So I just wanted to say that. And our, and our sidekick here, Ellen Bennett, um, who, you know, yeah. is has done so much <laughs> to, to help and educate and advocate and... In yeah, she's in honor of uh, her daughter uh, Katie, who passed away. So it's uh, we are a, a team oh. that is oh, out I'm there to so fight angry. and uh, continue to shout. It's amazing what two moms and a dad can do with a therapist on oh. the other end, right? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, we're yeah. all in this together, <laughs> yeah. and oh. it's all of us are bringing our passion together, and we connect. It is astonishing yeah. to see how much. We connect across the universe with people involved in eating disorders, trauma, mental health. So, so. yeah, and Sherry, thank you again. And this has been wonderful. And everyone remember, uh, Rock Vox and Scott Fitzgerald, the place to record your podcast, record your audio book, or do a legacy cast for your loved ones. Uh, thank you, Sherry. Have a wonderful rest of the day. And hopefully we will meet someday in person. Bless you, Sherry, and thank you, listeners.